Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. The United States is the only country in the developed world that does not guarantee access to primary health care for residents. Countries that provide health care as a human right often do so through a single-payer system, which replaces thousands of for-profit health insurance companies with a public universal plan. What is the problem with this country? Why do we equate health care with health insurance? Can grassroots activism correct our health care dysfunction? Let's discuss. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, Warm greetings, everybody. Greg, and we have also Kay Tillo with us. Uh, visiting from, you are in Southern Illinois, you're in Kentucky right now, is that correct? Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> Louisville, Kentucky. I've got a good friend lives there with you. So, And uh, what we want to discuss today is healthcare and the work and the activism that you have been doing, Kay, for years and years in trying to make sense of the dysfunction that's in our healthcare system and trying to improve it with um, more recently uh, your uh, emphasis on single single payer uh, healthcare. And so that's why we brought you on and I, I've, I've looked at you and your background and you have been a activist for quite a while working with nurses and organizing hospitals and give, give us a little background, uh, Kay, about, about some of the work you've done? Well, um, when I was very young, I went south to work in the civil rights movement, which is where I met Walter. And uh, after that, I uh, was mostly working in the union movement and um, with several different unions, but mostly with healthcare unions, first with 1199 and later with the Nurses Professional Organization, which is how I got into a focus on healthcare. Now, are you, are you a nurse also or? No, I am not. <laughs> but organize, or, organize the Nurses Union then. Right, I was, uh, I was the executive director of the Nurses Professional Organization here in Louisville during a period of time when uh, we took on Humana uh, the giant at the time they owned the hospitals as well as the insurance industry. So from where you started to where you are now, it was completely unorganized. I, I mean, there was no union whatsoever. Um, how about the segregation within the hospital systems in the, I, I guess I'll call you the South because K- Kentucky is kind of the South. T- tell me how, where you were and where you are now with those efforts. Uh, with organizing yeah. the union? Well, not very far along. You know, uh, the union movement has been uh, hard put to bring uh, additional workers into collective bargaining because of the massive uh, fight against that, uh, led by corporate power, but also backed up by the ineffectiveness of any, any law or agency that would really Uh, back up the rights of workers to organize. And uh, so in Kentucky, um, we won uh, the union in Paducah at Lourdes Hospital. And then uh, by the time of the end of the first contract, the employer was able to break, uh, break the union, forcing them out on strike. And in the other end of the state in Pikeville, um, it was organized twice, once by the communication workers and once by the steel workers, and both times they've broken the union. So there's uh, very little organized here, but, um, you know, a task ahead of us. Right. And, and I think that's where you logically get into this, I, this, this uh, feature of looking at our dysfunctional delivery system for health care, um, which, which gets us to your work for single payer. Tell, tell us about that. Um, well, I, I became aware of, you know, a single payer uh, effort, uh, I think sometime in the early 90s, 
um, uh, that was after the Physicians for National Health Program had published their founding of you know their position paper on what it would take to fix our healthcare system. And I read that and I became involved in it. And we here in Kentucky uh, formed an organization, the Kentucky Healthcare Coalition, and uh, began trying to work on it. Of course, that was the early 90s when that was happening. And that was when uh, the Clinton administration had appointed uh, Hillary to take on the healthcare. And uh, that was happening, that bill that Hillary drafted and worked out with the corporate powers that be to make sure that they were included in it. And then it never even uh, got to a vote. But during that time, there was a, a fairly strong uh, single payer movement. And uh, we, uh, it was, uh, many of the unions were in it. And I think it was the communication workers who was doing a lot of leading of that. And we had a big demonstration at the Humana building and uh, we wrapped red tape around the, the Humana building as an indication of how the profits that Humana makes cause there to be so much red tape that people are denied care. Um, mm -hmm. Then later, you know, the, the, the unions backed away from that full-fledged support for single payer. So, um, you know, much work is left to be done. Well, uh, Pat, we, we would be remiss if we did not uh, press Kay to talk about her efforts behind uh, labor for single payer. I think uh, her and Walter single-handedly uh, approached every major, minor, local, uh, county affiliate, et cetera, for, for endorsement of single payer. Uh, and and it, just, it was just an incredible task and an incredible accomplishment. Maybe, Kay, you could speak about that for a minute or two. Oh, I would love to. It was, it was kind of an amazing thing. I mean, it wasn't single-handed, you know, nothing happens without a little help from our friends. Uh, but uh, in, uh, well, in 2003, um, the uh, Physicians for a National Health Program was able to get uh, Congressman John Conyers to introduce a bill that reflected a single payer campaign and would remove the for-profit hospitals and nursing homes and would remove all of the for-profit, all of the insurance industry and publicly fund a system of healthcare with no co-pays and no deductibles with a, a financing system that was progressive. So once we had a piece of legislation you know, it was, it made it possible to approach the union movement to say, let's back this bill, let's push on it. And amazingly, the response was just uh, overwhelming. I think we started with, um, I had worked in the Coalition of Labor Union Women. So I knew the people in the Pittsburgh chapter and the, the Chicago chapter. So I got them to uh, introduce a resolution to the national clue. And then we had friends in uh, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, so they introduced it there. And then from those two formidable groups, we were able to move forward. And uh, I think the first uh, state AFL-CIO federation that we got on board was the Kentucky one, I believe that was in 2005. And uh, from there, we collected the lists of shop stewards and local union people and uh, tried to tell their stories. When a union would endorse, we would interview the members of the local about it and then put that out to a ever growing list. So uh, it, it became a formidable list. I think we got 44 state AFL-CIO federations and 157 central labor councils and over 600 totally. And I think it did have an impact on the labor movement. In 2009, um, the national AFL-CIO took a position uh, in favor of HR 676, which was the single payer bill. However, what they did is what many, many groups do. And that is they say, 
For the future, we believe this is the best, but for right now, we're gonna back <laughs> this Affordable Care Act or this whatever is the, the, the uh, proposal of the day that keeps the insurance industry inside. Right. Well, they are quite effective in setting the, uh, the narratives for why we should not have single payer. You know, they, they seem like they are, um, yeah, I mean, we, we have been trying to have this for years and years and years. It's not a new thing. Uh, and yet, um, you know, the, it, it, as I was preparing for this, I was listening to a lot of lectures with corporate executives expressing how horrible single payer would be. And there seems to be a couple themes. One is, you have these horrendous wait times that are just going to, you're going to be spending six months to be able to see a doctor and, uh, and that the wait time issue is um, remarkable and we really can't overcome that. Tell me about how you would respond to that. Well, first, it's uh, really not true. What we have to say is that in our country, there isn't even a waiting list to get on because if you don't have the money and you don't have the coverage and you need an expensive drug or an expensive surgery, there is very little opportunity that you are ever going to get that. And we have many, many tens of thousands who die every year uh, because not because they had diseases or conditions that were incurable, but because we as a nation did not come to their defense and make sure that this vast wealth of healthcare that we have got to those people. So let me just say that it, we have the worst uh, situation with people having to wait. And of course, another place where people wait is in Medicaid, um, Medicaid is the program that covers sort of the people who are poor or disabled in our country, low income people. Those people have a tremendous difficulty in finding specialists who will see them because the payments for them are so low that uh, they cannot get in, so they can wait forever as well. But let me just say, uh, Canada has a single payer system and there's a lot of talk about their waiting list, but, um, and Canada certainly is not perfect. <laughs> uh, you know, they have uh, a ways to go, but they are so much better than we are because this, the situation where people don't get care, they can't get seen, does not exist. Uh, they have to wait uh, for elective surgery, like knee replacements and hip replacements and things that are not urgent. But if they have an emergency or if they need vital care, cancer, whatever, immediately they get it. There's no waiting list for urgent need uh, in Canada. And while their system isn't perfect, you know, I have friends there in the healthcare union. And I always use Canada as this is the good system. And they always write back. They say, well, it's not good enough because it's not funded well enough. And, you know, right. those things are also true. You know, right. you have to fund a system. But either a single payer system or a national health service would be a momentous thing for our nation to get the profits out of healthcare and open the door to real care for everyone. So I, I think you're making an important point that the, the wait time issue, the, the, um, the baseline of what we're talking about is skewed by the fact that we don't, we don't put into that all these people that don't have in health insurance that just don't get care. You know, right. and that's a big that's a big issue. The other thing that I noticed is I'm looking at the rankings of the overall uh, different um, countries. Uh, of all of the wait times, it looks like that Canada has some of the higher wait times compared to other single payers. 
UK, Switzerland, Norway, Netherlands, Germany, France, Australia. They all seem to be able to manage their wait times pretty, pretty well. And um, the, the, but the two statistics that I think stick out the most for me or the most remarkable are just the cost per person, which is just astronomical in our country, and then the satisfaction. We have the, some of the lowest <laughs> satisfaction compared to other countries. So if they are all on a single payer and doing it much cheaper and they're much happier, I'm, I'm not sure why that isn't being more prominent in the argument for a single payer. I don't know, what, what do you think about that? Well, certainly much cheaper and uh, uh, much happier are both very, very good things. Right, right. Uh, uh, patients are happier when they get care and physicians and nurses are happier when they don't have uh, the barriers to care that we have with the insurance industry and the profits. I, you know, increasingly doctors spend much of their time on the phone trying to get pre-authorization, trying to get authorization to use the drug they need uh, or to do a procedure that because what has happened is that the insurance industry has been able to write into their plans many, many ways in which they can deny care. And as a matter of fact, one of the, the things that happened with the Affordable Care Act is that while we covered uh, maybe about 20 million additional people, lately we still 30 million without coverage, but we increase the number of people who are what's called underinsured. They nominally have insurance, but the deductible is so high and the copay is so high that they cannot use their health care plan. And therefore they go without. I think the figures are like 38% of the people in the country uh, delay care or no, have someone in their family who has delayed care because of the cost. Mm -hmm. That is an outrage because when we know that the delay in cancer care or diabetes or heart conditions and all of these things, it's the delay that's gonna be deadly. And so it, it is inhuman and criminal that we have a system that puts delay in there solely in order to increase the profits. And it certainly does. Right, right, right. You know, when you look at outcomes, uh, just recently in the last few days, uh, shocking news came out about how our healthcare system failed us in the pandemic. And mm -hmm. the, the drop in life expectancy was stunning. And what else would you attribute it to other than our healthcare system and its failure? And this is in regard to other countries, we, we perform very poorly. Yes, well, uh, even before the pandemic, I think uh, our life expectancy was four years behind, say, the Italians. And, you know, the insurance companies always say, oh, well, that's because uh, Americans live less healthy lives and they smoke and they do all of that. Well, those aren't the reasons. The French smoke more than we do. You know, there are all kinds of other reasons. Others say, you know, hey, people overuse the healthcare system. That's what makes it so expensive. But we have fewer visits to the doctor annually, on average, maybe around four. And the Japanese have 12. Uh, we have fewer days in the hospital and other countries have more. They're getting more care and yet they are providing that care for about half as much as we are spending per capita. Yeah, I noticed in my, in my list here that uh, number one for healthy lives of all those countries I mentioned is France. Cool. You know, <laughs> you know, number, I, is there, I, you know, they smoke like, you know, but good food, healthy, I guess, you know, there's a lot of other features that, that contribute to that. And they have health care. They get to go to the doctor or right. the doctor can even come to their home. Right. Or, you know, people are not excluded from the basics of modern medicine. Right. Like we are. Right, right. 
So let me go through another one of these uh, I, I, uh, talking points or this is sort of how the, this is framed by the people against the single payer. I, I recently reread Lakoff's, George Lakoff's book, uh, there, the, Don't Think of the Elephant in the Room, which talk about how much more effective the conservatives are in framing issues than are the liberals. Here's the other, here's the other frame that they have is, wh why should I pay for other people's insurance? If they're living this life that's unhealthy, why am I being forced to pay for, for their poor decisions? It's this sort of kind of critical father issue. It's, it's the issue of we're not in this all together that uh, you, know, you deserve in a, in a Calvinist way, you deserve maybe what you get because of your poor, your poor choices. And I don't want to be subsidizing people that make these poor choices because I make very good choices. <laughs> Tell me about that. It's kind of an ugly conservative uh, Ayn Rand type of, of um, uh, you know, Dar you know in, in a way a little bit Darwinian, but that's, that's foundational also to their, that, that, that goes into this issue of therefore no single payer. I don't want to be paying for your bad lifestyle. Tell me about that. Well, you know, everyone um, except the super wealthy would pay less for health care under a single payer system. So if we had that single payer system, those people would not pay more. I think the other thing is the idea that um, if uh, you get more, I get less. So if everybody's kids are getting good care and uh, your kids aren't on the bus with people with TB, your kids are gonna be healthier too. I mean, we have to look at the things that we in common have um, to make life better and people would not pay more. But that, that's the insurance company outlook is that they're, you know, uh, living off of you and you would have to right. pay more and right. therefore we should deny them care. Right. We would all live better in a society where everyone has care. I mean, that's true of education too. I mean, right. you want just your kids to have an education and live in a world where nobody else has a chance to read and write and develop their human faculties. It's a horrible world. We want these good things of life to be expanded throughout the society. And uh, that's a part of the argument. And uh, the US should be ashamed of the criminal figures that we have in terms of what's happening to our people because we have no healthcare system that is available to everyone. Right, that's a good argument. The same argument with education. Why should I pay for your kid? Why should I pay for your healthcare? It's that, it's this, uh, it's a very self-centered centered um, way of looking at things. Okay, what do, what do the American people think about uh, single payer or Medicare for all? I mean, how's the battle going? How's the, how's the world well, going? <laughs> the battle go, you know, we're doing very well with the public. In other words, the whole idea that the American people are all so backward and hate everybody else and don't want them back, it's not true. We had the vast majority of people want everyone to have care. And we have majorities that are for an improved Medicare for all. And um, so that's going very well. What is not going well is that, you know, you would think that in a democracy, when you have majority opinion, you ought to be able to transfer that into political effectiveness and then those Congress people that represent those people would then vote in the plan that the people want. And that's the problem that we're having is that the Congress is not responding to this massive public sentiment uh, in the clutches of uh, those companies who profit from the system as it is. And that's the crisis, but how do we make it how do we make the public uh, support 
effective politically. And that's a difficult thing to try to do. Well, even 63% of doctors support the pub public option. I mean, you know, it's not just, it's not, you know, it's, it's not just the patients, it's also the doctors are seeing the dysfunction in this. Yeah, well, the doctors are hard put under this because uh, there's so much insurance company interference with their practice mm -hmm. that we're losing a lot of doctors. It's a really, really bad shape. Mm -hmm. So what happened in New York? They were, they were going to do this single payer and it looked like it was there. And I, what, last week it looked like it fell apart. Have you followed that? I have. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, what, what's the problem? Well, uh, at, the, at the base of that problem uh, with the New York plan is that it really isn't possible to do single payer in one state. Okay. Like Vermont, Vermont tried that and they, uh, fell, they fell short too, right? Well, they, the, the plan that actually was passed in Vermont was not a single payer plan. Mm. It was called a pathway to single payer. In other words, they passed something that uh, was less than single payer. And then when they couldn't implement it, um, the single payer movement got the blame as single payer doesn't work when Governor Shumlin uh, dropped it and uh, said he didn't want to put into effect the tax that it would make. But the basic problem of the state, you know, uh, the state efforts is that we now have huge numbers of people covered by federal national health care plans, Medicare in particular. And single payer is based on the concept that you get all of the streams of funding into one public pot in order to streamline the administrative uh, measures and use the savings from that to cover more people and to expand care. Well, you can't get Medicare money into the state pot unless you Newt Gingrich-like allocate it to the states. In other words, if you which is a backward thing to do. We don't want to give money to the, from our best federal program to the states. It seems so it's a strange thing. And uh, I have dear friends who are working on those state plans, but so far they're never able to pass uh, them. Now the, the New York bill is, is a, a, a single payer bill, except that it's got some, uh, um, some of the problems of, uh, what should I say? It doesn't have the full global budgeting uh, in it, but it's a concern. I keep working to persuade those state single payer people to join us in the battle on the national level, because I think healthcare is a national responsibility. We don't want to allow them to shift it to the states you know, since when have states' rights played a forward motion <laughs> within our nation? And it's a, it is, it's a difficult thing, but I would urge our friends in California and New York to come help us on the national level. Uh, I believe that's where it has to be done and uh, where it is not easy, but it is within the realm of possibility. In other words, if we passed a national single payer bill, one, it would be like Medicare, it would pass constitutional muster. Two, it would get it away from the states. You know, states have a uh, responsibility to balance their budget. So what's gonna happen? And when you shift healthcare to the states, they're always cutting the budgets because they're trying to balance. On a national level, we don't have to do that. We have the ability to put into the funding whatever we need. And, you know, there's no reason to, uh, to be, we've seen California's passed it over and over again. They kept passing it when, uh, when Muscles was governor. And, uh, uh, you know, of course he wasn't gonna sign it, right? So then with it, but California's never passed it with a budget in it, with money in it. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think the states can do it. I think that we have to do it nationally. Greg, so, is this just okay. a problem of capitalism? Is this just, of course, is this just of course, classic of course. American graft capitalism where you've got- I mean, look, the, the, the notion, the common notion is that if the people want it, then the representatives will follow suit and give it to them. Right. Obviously that's broken. So the frustration that comes with not, not getting single payer, even though most people support it, I think in that poll taken during the election uh, by Fox News, uh, 60 some, 70 percent of the people they interviewed were for it. Right. So right. there's this breakdown. Then obviously it's not a matter of getting more people to support it. It's a matter of getting the politicians to respond. So to me, to my mind, the question is, how do we get the politicians to respond? And Kay mentions these state bills. I think there are a lot of frustrated people in the single payer movement who work very hard and they're not willing to take on the politicians. They've already won the battle of popularity, but they don't know what to do. So they think maybe they'll get a better hearing in their state if it's New York state or California or one of the richer states and so on. That doesn't solve the problem. The problem is the lack of response by the politicians. Right. And we have two parties. We only have two parties. And I would suggest that uh, I, I don't see a way that you're going to get that with these two parties. Ergo, maybe we need another party. And, uh, and that party would be disconnected from the insurance industry and wouldn't be getting millions of dollars, and wouldn't getting lobbyists coming in and free dinners. And the drug companies wouldn't be uh, handing them money, uh, taking them out, entertaining right. them, and so on. These things are the roadblocks. But I think the movement has to recognize that, that these are the roadblocks. So you can't run off and do, do your single payer thing somewhere else. It has to be done nationally and we have to be ready to tackle that issue. How do we get politicians to do what they should do? It's, a, it's an issue that really encumbers everything. So yes, it's a matter of capitalism. Ultimately, the problem is that the dam that keeps the people's will from being met is capitalism because that's what's keeping these politicians from being representatives. Was Jimmy Dore right? Should we have forced the vote? Vote. I mean, how? Where did we fall there? That was the 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 small group of liberal progressives in Congress that were going to mandate at least an up down vote on a single payer, and knowing that it would fail, it at least put people on the record. Oh, we need we we need to get to a vote, <laughs> right? Because we have, you see, we have, uh, because the issue is so popular, we have lots of candidates running on a Medicare for all platform. And many of them, once they are elected, they say, well, I'm for that. I'll put that on my record. That helps me get votes. But in the meantime, I'm going to back this public option or some other plan, all of which plans keep the for-profit industry in charge. And you know, now we have another worse thing that's happening. Our public programs, which are publicly funded, Medicare and Medicaid mainly, Medicare for those over 65 and uh, people who are permanently disabled and also for uh, uh, people on dialysis. Well, both of those programs are now invaded <laughs> by the private insurers. Uh, Medicare, 40% uh, now are in these Medicare Advantage plans. It's the privatized Medicare that where huge sums of money are being made from the public money that we're paying for. And the Medicaid programs, the same thing. In, in every state, I think, except Connecticut and uh, Oklahoma, they, there are private for-profit insurers who are taking over the management of the Medicaid programs and are sucking out for profit um, the public money that we have there. So we are very much in danger of losing our Medicare as they continue to try to privatize it. So and, it's and these are all just fine until you get sick and need to get actual care. That's right. You can get a Medicare Advantage program, a private program, for less per month. Right. But if you get sick, you will pay more 
because that's the way they're designed to make you want to get out when they can't make more money off you. And they're a terrible ripoff, uh, a terrible ripoff of the public treasury. And um, it's something we need to take on and we haven't got any politicians saying, you know, take on. You know, even those who are saying lower the Medicare age to 60 aren't saying, well, that would also open up another 23, 24 million people uh, to being abused by Medicare Advantage and to big windfalls for, you know, private insurance companies. So t tell me about Tell me about these, the practices of insurance companies with their surprise bills and their patterns of just not paying, not paying, not paying to kind of, you know, beat down people to quit submitting their bills and um, delaying in payment. Uh, are, are these getting, is this getting worse or is, just, just, is this just me? <laughs> oh, that's worse. That's worse. And, you know, <laughs> It's intentional, right? It's intentional. Yes, it is. It's intentional. They, uh, uh, the rate of denial in Medicare Advantage is much greater than in uh, Medicare. Basically, there's no denial in Medicare unless there's some kind of fraud. And uh, for insurance companies have put in a whole series of barriers to care because you see, they and those academic uh, spokespeople uh, who uh, toady their line say that our healthcare is too expensive, the most expensive system in the world. We're spending 11, 12,000 per person. Their analysis is that people are overusing it and therefore we have to crunch in on this overuse. So then they put up the deductibles, therefore the copays, therefore the pre-authorization that is needed, the denials, the slow payments, anything to slow down uh, actually effectively getting the care. Um, we say that that's the problem is not, um, is the opposite, uh, that people are not getting the care that they need soon enough and that the problem of too costly a system is the profits and all of the mechanisms that they set up in order to capture those profits, those administrative mechanisms, utilization review, you know, you gotta uh, do more and more and more to try to uh, weed out uh, uh, paying for things you shouldn't pay for. You know, it's not a problem if someone goes to a doctor an extra time a year. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's not much of a problem uh, unless there's uh, corruption there to send person for an MRI or a CT scan because who's to say that that precautionary effort wasn't a legitimate decision? Uh, we need, you know, but those are questioned every time by the, by, the, by the insurance industry. And if you go into one of those Medicare Advantage plans, you better plan to spend your time arguing with the company all of the time. And if you want to go back to traditional Medicare, you're no longer protected from discrimination for pre-existing conditions. Oh, wait, now explain that. Tell, tell me about that. Okay, well. So I'm in one of these Advantage plans. Right. And now I'm trying to pull the plug on it and I realize this is this has been a problem. I made a mistake. I want to go back to Medicare. What, well, tell me what you mean by this. Well, you, when you go back to traditional Medicare, you will probably want to purchase a Medigap plan, a, a um, supplementary plan. Uh, and that those plans are available to seniors when they first sign up without regard to pre-existing conditions. So there's no discrimination in the beginning. Okay. But once you go into a Medicare Advantage plan and then you want to return, then uh, the Medigap plan, the supplementary insurance can charge you more or can even refuse to sell to you. 
so people can get trapped in those. There are four states that have banned that practice, and uh, I think they're all in the Northeast, but the rest of the 46 states, you can be denied purchasing uh, a Medigap plan without regard to pre-existing conditions. So, you know, the Affordable Care Act didn't do away <laughs> with discrimination for pre-existing conditions. All kinds of plans have set up uh, the drugs that particularly sick people need, like people with MS or people with AIDS or other uh, diabetes. They set up the drugs that th this group of people needs on a tier so high that people have to pay a thousand or 2000 a month for it. And therefore they keep out of their plan, the people who have those conditions, because you're not gonna purchase a plan that the drug you need is gonna cost you a thousand dollars a month. So there is still discrimination for pre-existing conditions, no matter how many times they say the ACA did away with that, uh, they did not. And uh, it still exists. And we have the worst health care system for the wealthy nations in the world. And it's not getting better. And that's why the single payer movement is so vital. Well, there's got to be a special cul-de-sac in hell for these people, don't you think? Just a little place they can all get together and you know, <laughs> be denied water. and. You know, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. They certainly are getting away with some horrendous, horrendous decisions. And then they parade around as the saviors. Right, uh, right. Uh, you know. How are doctors react? Are doctors uh, shifting uh, uh, their support towards Medicare for all, towards uh, single payer? I mean, this uh, current medical system, this current healthcare system, if you want to call it healthcare, it's really health insurance system, works against them as well, does it not? It does, and I think more and more doctors are supportive of single-payer health care, and um, that's a good thing. And of course, some of them are leading, you know, this effort to uh, move to a single-payer system. Uh, there's a lot of unhappiness, a lot of unhappiness with the electronic medical systems because in our country, you know, the electronic medical systems are basically geared around billing. So the physician has to put in a million different things into the electronic records that is related to the billing. And that's getting worse because under uh, the Affordable Care Act, there were a number of uh, innovations put into place that are like called pay for performance or bundling or medical homes or value-based payments that are now saying to doctors, we're gonna pay you less. It's an insult to think that a physician would do give better care because they're offered an extra $5. I mean, it's, you know, it's an insulting thing. And these pay for performance systems are discriminating against uh, the poorest and uh, against minorities because um, if you're measuring on outcome, you cannot, you can't actually put a money figure on the value of that care. And so you have worse outcomes in communities of poverty. You have worse outcomes in communities that don't have safe drinking water or don't have good housing. And yet the physicians are going to be punished under this system because the outcomes are worse if they serve a patient population that is uh, less wealthy. So there are all kinds of discrimination in this system that we have. And those were the innovations of the Affordable Care Act, all written by the insurance industry uh, and really terrible, terrible things. And we have to do away with all of that kind of payment. Um, the single payer plan would do that through a global budgeting that would pay a hospital uh, not based in detail on each particular procedure, but what it needs to serve that community. And that's really what we need to go to. Okay, how, how about the VA? Isn't that an effective system? It's not for profit. Our it own is. administration and, and its services, what, 
millions of people? Yeah, it, it, it does very, very well. There are lots of studies that show that the their electronic health system is much, much better because it's not based on billing. <laughs> and uh -huh. um, it, it's, uh, it's really does well. Um, there have been some efforts to undercut the VA and under five. So it's not perfect, but if you look at how the VA follows up on patients, they do very, very well. And uh, we need, it's a good system. It's a very, very good system uh, that uh, does a lot. And not everybody can get into it. You know, you can't, uh, uh, they have their means tested as well uh, for illnesses that aren't service related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just is, uh, is it, is it two, two billion people per every doctor? There's two people that do nothing but insurance and paperwork for every doctor. I think it's two to one, is that right? I'm not sure I know those figures. I've heard that, uh, that they're just huge, you know, the mm -hmm. amount of people to do the billing. Uh, and that's, that's the part that, that uh, ought not to be in the system. You know, we ought to just fund the hospital. And you see, the other thing is that with our system, we have the hospitals moving away from areas like Appalachia, East Kentucky, moving away from the inner cities because they're seeking the private pay patients whose insurance pays at higher rates than Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we gain with a single payer system is all of us would be paid for at the same rate. None of us would be valued more in terms of what would be paid for our hospital or our physician. So we could actually build our hospitals where there's human need rather than based on the wealth of the people in the area. Right, you know, I had, a, I had my physical with my doctor and because of COVID it was done with Zoom. And uh, I was given an opportunity to have my physical the year later and he said do you want to come in or do zoom and I said zoom work fine I'm you know I'm healthy I don't really and I in talking to him very good physician I said are you going to be using zoom as a part of your protocol in seeing patients you know you, you it seems like for a percentage of your practice it would work very efficiently. And he said, you know, I, he really wants to have one day of remote for every four days of patients. And he said exactly that, that it's very efficient. I can, uh, I can see people quickly. The appointments are on time. It works better for everybody. He said, the only problem is we, I just don't know if the insurance company will let me do this. <laughs> it's like, who, who's in charge here? You know, who, who, is this the good for patients? Company. You're a doctor. You're, this is your practice. And he basically said, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a group here and I, it's going to be based on whether or not the insurance company is going to be able to extract wealth from th this system or not. I just, it, you could tell he was very sad recounting that, but I, it, it, we're like frogs in a pot of boiling water. It just is getting, you know, we don't realize that all of a sudden we're waking up and it's boiling. How did we get here? I guess is the... Well, I, I, I would stress again, it's not the people. I mean, I know Kay can attest to this, but when I've been involved with demonstrations around healthcare and locally in Pittsburgh, it's uh, UPMC is the big, the big uh, powerhouse. And you can't believe the number of people that honk their horns and give you the V sign and are with you. Because I would guess that after banks, the healthcare system, the healthcare insurance companies are the most hated institution. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So again, we don't need, I don't think, to convince people. They're already convinced. What we need is a mechanism, a means, a way of getting the politicians to do what the people want. And, and I think that's the stage we're at with, with, uh, with uh, single payer as well as other issues. But I would also say that this is something it's not going to go easy because there's profit involved and there's enormous profit involved. And if we had a single payer, it would essentially start a snowball. Why do we need insurance companies? It would effectively take the fire, the, the, the finance uh, insurance element of our economy 
and show it as a fraud it is and, and make it public. Because uh, the truth of the matter is a monkey could do the actuarial work to figure out how, it, how much it costs to do things by taking all the data. And that can be easily an, a, a public function and it should be. But it's gonna be a long slug because it's not tax the people. It's really to take the money away from these insurance companies. And that's gonna be a tremendous battle. And it's a political battle with the politicians. And the congressmen and the advertising agencies and the, all the, you know, the, the whole system that surrounds this, that's trying to extract rents from the care of people's health. That, that's the sad thing. So. There, there is coming up uh, on July 24, a March for Medicare for All, which um, is happening in 23 or some people say as high as 32 cities across the country that is trying to galvanize an outpouring of sentiment that would push in the direction of um, a Medicare for all, a national uh, plan. So we're doing that here in Louisville. We, we have a demonstration being planned and we're working on co-sponsors and all. So I think that demonstrations can be important. I think that they're important in terms of um, of making visible that public support for this plan. Mm -hmm. I'll look that up and we'll link that into our, our description. The 24th, their Medicare for All March. July 24, right. Um, There's one in DC and uh, other places all across the country. Well, Kay, you're just wonderful. And I think you don't realize how um, a powerful and influence you've been in other work in the area of, of, of medical care with your union work. And now with this, it's more important than all. And having these Joan of Arcs that are getting on their horse and coming in <laughs> and saying, we need this and this is right. And uh, you're, you're a very powerful voice. And I, I'm, I'm glad you were able to chat with us about this. Thank you, Pat and Greg. I was really happy to be with you. Good. Well, thank you so much, and we'll link to the description below uh, some information for your for for this, and uh, see if we can't get other people uh, active through your through your your uh, good services. So, all right. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.